Good afternoon and welcome to our final session of our first uh, webinar series. I'm Laurent Lamblin and will be your host today. Our final session will focus on how to integrate emotions in the investment process. In a more traditional setting, the advisor can often cope and even counterbalance the most unproductive emotional reactions of an investor. But how to do it in a more consistent way, especially in a digital context without human encouragement? Today, our speakers will inspire you in tackling this challenge. Our first speaker, Sanjeev Das, is professor at, uh, of finance and data science at Santa Clara University's Levy School of Business. He's also an Amazon scholar at Amazon Web Services. He previously held faculty appointments as professor at Harvard Business School and UC Berkeley. He holds numerous postgraduate degrees and among others, and I hope I won't forget any, finance, computer science, accounting, economics, and business administration. He not only published one over 100 publications, but is also a senior editor of the Journal of Investment Management, associate editor of Management Science and other academic journals, and is on the advisory board of the Journal of Financial Data Science. He also has a solid business background in the financial industry. Indeed, prior to being an academic, he worked in the derivatives business in the Asia Pacific region as a VP at Citibank. During his session, he will inspire you with a novel framework for goals-based wealth management, a framework consistent with modern portfolio theory while integrating behavioral finance findings. His publication on the topic won the 2018 Markowitz Award. He co-developed the robo-advisor Franklin Templeton launched in 2020. But before discovering how this approach can improve the communication between advisors and clients and produce better advice, enabling your clients to attain their goals with a higher probability, Jürgen van der Brucke will give you a brief introduction on the importance of the challenge and how to boost investor engagement. Jürgen has over 20 years of experience at various entities within the KBC Group. Formerly the head of innovation at KBC Asset Management, Jürgen is now the founder and managing director of Everyone Invested, the KBC Asset Management Wealth Tech spin-off. Jürgen holds a PhD in behavioral finance and has published numerous academic publications on the topic, one of which is co-authored uh, with Sanjeev Das. He teaches financial engineering at University of Antwerp and is a research associate at the renowned EDIC Risk Institute. Please do not hesitate to post your questions in the chat. The speakers will be glad to answer your questions during the Q&A sessions after their presentation. And now let me hand over the screen to Jürgen for the next five to 10 minutes. Jürgen, it's all yours. Thank you, Laurent. I had to look a bit for the right screen to share. So welcome everybody indeed. Just a brief introduction from my side, uh, linking the title of today's webinar with the mission of everyone invested and making the bridge to our uh, renowned speaker Sanjeev Das on the topic today. So in this slide I want to briefly summarize and most of you have uh, participated also in our previous webinars where we showed in multiple ways that everyone invested's mission is to make investor engagement and onboarding more effective in a digital context, as Laurent hinted on it, in the context where there is no human encouragement. And we borrow heavily from the insights from behavioral finance, ultimately wrapping our knowledge into components, technology components, which we call behavioral smarts. And the goal we have and to, to reach with these uh, behavioral smarts in enriching in a modular way your existing digital investment processes is actually threefold. First one way is to say we want to improve conversion. We want people to go through the journey successfully by taking it beyond automation so that the lack of human encouragement is compensated. We also want to do that by leveraging and expanding our reach, meaning that through digitization, we want to reach new investors and notably younger investors. And finally, perhaps even most important, 
we want to keep people invested once they have started by explicitly addressing the fear of losses. To put it simple, uh, avoiding that people use your digital channels only to push the sell button. So in a very nutshell, this is the mission of everyone invested with core behavioral smarts at the center of our uh, proposition. And the way we position this also is to, we always like to refer to a famous quote by motivating this mission. And the quote says that indeed, in order to a challenge or to, to face the greatest open challenge of financial technology, we have to be able to manage the emotional component of investing. So again, phrasing differently that the lack of human encouragement in a digital context needs to be, well, perhaps even overcompensated. And apart from this quote being a nice bridge between everyone invested and the title of today's webinar, there's also a very nice and interesting link to our speaker of today. Because the quote of this statement here has been made by Andrew Lowe some time ago, who himself is a thought leader in behavioral finance and artificial intelligence as well. And the combination of both, he likes to call it artificial humanity linking or referring to, well, algorithms that ultimately have as a goal to better understand and better anticipate human behavior. Now, the nice thing is that Andrew Lowe and Sanjeev Das are very well uh, for good friends or very well known to each other and each other's research. So it's a bit of a teaser, of course, that this quote by Andrew Lowe has, is saying that, okay, this is the greatest open challenge to address this emotional component uh, in, of investing in a digital way. And actually at the time he made the quote back in 2016, he added another sentence saying that it is indeed the greatest open challenge because it explains why driverless cars are already more successful than even the best robo advisors. Now, of course, this quote dates back from 2016, not knowing what evolution and new technology would be developed, for example, the one that Sanjeev Das will now explain us in length, because indeed, as Laurent has hinted on, not only did the underlying methodology uh, make uh, Sanjeev win the renowned Markowitz Award back in 2018, but also recently and quite globally, I have understood, it has been used to power the robo-advisor of Franklin Templeton. So maybe this quote might be a bit outdated, but I'm sure that Sanjeev will explain us in the fullest how his development has worked and how it now is currently applied. So without further ado, I would like to invite Sanjeev to take the screen and take us to sunny California. Thanks, uh, Jürgen, for a very kind introduction. And uh, I'm going to uh, take over the screen. All right, so I'll get started. This is uh, a collection of three papers actually, and we call the sort of field goal-based wealth management. Uh, and uh, it's joint work with my colleague in the math department, Dan Ostrov, uh, and my two colleagues at Franklin Templeton, uh, Anand Radhakrishnan and Deep Srivastava. I think Andy actually, Anand is on the, has joined the webinar as well. So, so glad to see him, see him here. Uh, uh, just to give you a quick overview, I will be talking about three papers. Uh, the first one was the one that got the award. The second one uh, it converted that paper into a dynamic problem. And the third one actually deals with multiple goals and, and tries to capture the emotional content of what investors actually want with, uh, with their financial planning over their life cycle. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so typically an investor normally, you know, think of setting up a portfolio with a single goal. But what we want to do is deal with multiple goals eventually. Uh, investors find it pretty hard to trade off all their different multiple goals. So we wanted to build something uh, that was emotionally easy for the investors to work with, but also uh, technically and mathematically a framework in which investors could meet a whole bunch of different goals at different points in time uh, with a portfolio strategy that does everything in one account. It doesn't require multiple accounts. So a lot of uh, uh, robot advisors, for example, will say, you know, four or five goals, and then you open up separate accounts for each of those things. And what happens with that, of course, is that uh, you are uh, optimal within each account, but across all the accounts, you may not be reaching a global optimal. And so one of the ideas here is that by building everything with multiple goals into one account, uh, you can actually get to a much better optimal across all these accounts. Uh, so, so that's sort of the big picture, and we'll start with a building block from the first paper, move on to the second, and then 
eventually get to the third, and I'll try and do it quickly so that we have time for questions. So portfolio risk is, is so obviously everybody wants to maximize the growth rate or the return on the portfolio, and then they have different notions of risk. And usually we view standard deviation of returns uh, or the volatility of the portfolio as one measure of risk. We want to introduce a second measure of risk, which is the probability that you want to attain your financial goals. This is what uh, spikes the emotional sort of uh, side of the investor a lot better. Uh, volatility is certainly something investors uh, uh, you know, are familiar with. They, they tend to feel it. But they're really not worried about volatility as long as they can be reassured that you're still on track to meet your goals. And so that's sort of the big picture idea here. Uh, and it's also language that is easier for the investor to understand. Plus, it takes the long run view and is not short term. You know, when you talk of volatility, usually people think of, you know, quarter to quarter or year to year, uh, you know, volatility and performance uh, led to a benchmark most often. And, uh, and when you talk about goals, you're really looking long term. And so for people who are looking at retirement portfolios, certainly uh, the idea that the probably you won't reach some goal 10, 15 years out is an important criterion. And so both these things are going to be implemented in the solution together. OK, so I'm going to show you the bare bones idea first, and then we'll move on to now what's different in this framework. We're going to use properties, not just standard deviation risk measure. It's long term versus short term. We get different portfolios than you'd get with standard mean variance optimization, though we will actually use mean variance optimal portfolios. Uh, we can do a lot better with customization for each investor so that one size doesn't fit all. Normally, there's a situation the traditional financial advisor would sit there and say, I'm just going to try and figure out if my investor is medium, low, or high risk, and then drop him into one of three portfolios. But we don't sort of have anything that drives them towards their goals in that fashion, or uh, it doesn't customize very well. It's a one size fits all. Uh, kind of solution. Uh, we will not statically rebalance year after year. We will actually do this dynamically. So we'll take into account future goals and trade them off against uh, earlier ones. Uh, we will show you a framework that is consistent with mean variance theory and behavioral portfolio theory. So the idea was to try and marry these two things. Uh, there's a lot of target date funds that do glide path investing. This is not glide path investing. If you want to think of an analogy that's close to it, we're going to call it glide surface. And I'll make that clear as we go along. It is definitely not life cycle based. Uh, the only life cycle component tends to be the goals which the customer will or the investor will want over time. Uh, we can have a simple metric for over and under performance of the portfolio relative to goals. So for example, if you set up the portfolio and you had only one goal, for example, and you wanted a 90% chance of reaching that goal, and the algorithm tells you, hey, right now you have a 95% chance of reaching a goal, then that extra 5% is a good measure of overperformance. Or the, the investor really thought he would like to have 90% chances of reaching a goal, and you're below that by, say, 10%. And so you have another metric of performance, which is, which is somewhat different than traditional metrics of performance. And then finally, like I told you at the beginning, you can combine all the mental accounts into one account as well. There's, there's a lot of disconnects. So, you know, Franklin did a nice uh, bunch of focus groups and surveys. I'm just showing you one picture. By and large, there's a disconnect. On the left is really... Uh, what financial advisors think of, uh, investors want. They sort of think 50-50 split between the performance of individual investments and overall portfolio, whereas customers generally tend to think much more in terms of their overall portfolio and less in terms of their individual investments. So right there, you see financial advisors having sort of a, a slight disconnect with what customers actually want. We will implement actually Brunel's goal probability uh, you know, framework. So Jean Brunel had this uh, nice framework of you know, four levels of goals, dreams, wishes, wants, and needs. And obviously the probability with which you want to succeed is gonna be higher for the needs and much lower for the dreams, okay? So this, this is a lot of behavioral theory in here that talks about you know, uh, getting to basic goals and then having aspirations for higher goals like dreams. And so you can build all that into the framework of multiple goals and we'll see how to do that. Uh, asking people, you know, what their uh, probability of, of getting to a goal might be is easier for them to answer than asking them things about correlations, asking them things about outperforming a benchmark. Standard investors don't understand these mathematical connotations very well. Whereas if you just say, what's the chance with which you're willing to, you know, reach a goal, uh, they're much more comfortable answering that. And you can see this was some one of the focus groups that, that uh, we got these responses. Okay, so what we're going to do is have an approach that allocates the portfolio so that you optimize the property that the investor meets their goals while actually being mean variance uh, optimal as well. So a little bit of mathematics to get everybody warmed up here. 
the uh, the you can choose any kind of driving equation for wealth. So you start out with a wealth in your portfolio of W0. And this, this wealth will basically evolve over time. And the driving equation is, in this case, is a geometric ground in motion. So we basically have a, a mean mu and a volatility sigma for the portfolio. And Z is a shock. In this case, it's normally distributed, but you could draw it from any distribution you like. So if you want to use a fat tail distribution, this framework works just as well. If I take this initial equation, which is very familiar to anybody who's worked with, with wealth processes and rearrange it, I can put the mean on one side and the variance and standard deviation on the other. And then I have a target wealth and an initial wealth. So if my target wealth is 500,000, my initial wealth is 400,000, and I want to get there over 10 years with a property of 80%, then I can fill in Z0, which is the normal cutoff for 80%. So it's just a standard normal variable for 80%. I put 500,000 in here, 400,000 in here, and T is 10. And then I can pick combinations of mu and sigma to generate lots and lots of points. So I have pairs of mu and sigma that will satisfy this equation. And if I plot that, I will get this particular picture. So these, this entire curve here is all the combinations of sigma and mu, risk and return, that are going to give me an 80% chance of getting to that particular goal. And we call this the gold probability level curve. Obviously, I would like to live in this blue region because in this blue region, I have a bigger than 80% chance of reaching that goal. Below this line, I have a less than 80% chance of reaching the goal. So that's basically the first starting point for this framework is to see this geometric object. Now, I can overlay this geometric object on different properties. So for example, that was the 80% uh, curve. But if I wanted a 90% chance of getting to that 500,000, then the curve would be slightly higher and the set of admissible portfolios would lie in the region above this curve. And at 99%, this would be the region and so on. All right, so you can actually have different curves for different properties. We can overlay these curves on the efficient frontier. So the green line here is the efficient frontier. This dark blue line is the 80% 80, 80 probability, gold probability curve. And so there's a large number of, of asset combinations that lie on this efficient frontier that are above the 80% probability curve. And so, I could be sitting here and being above 80% probability of getting to my goals. I could be sitting here or I could be sitting here and so on. What I'd really like to do is take this blue line and rotate it outwards until it, it has a tangent to the efficient frontier where I get this, this point. And if I look at that point, that is the optimal probability point that I want when I maximize the probability of reaching my goals. And that point occurs at 86.6% in this example. So even if I have an 80% desire to reach that goal, it turns out that the algorithm that actually maximizes it is simply the geometry of taking this blue line, rotating it out, and getting to the tangent on the efficient frontier, because that one allows me the highest probability of reaching my goals. Okay, so that's a geometric intuition for how this is working. Obviously, we need to do this mathematically. So mathematically, I'm going to take that same equation here and rearrange it to put Z on the left side. And so now Z, which is the normal cutoff for the 80% or whatever it is, is going to have this, this expression here with the initial wealth G, uh, W naught, and G is the goal. So this is 400,000, that was 500,000. So what I really want to do is if I maximize Z, then I'm maximizing, uh, I'm moving that line out till it is, is, it, it is the highest possible. And so this, by maximizing Z, I'm also maximizing the probability of reaching my goal. But I have to do it in such a way that I live on the efficient frontier. So it turns out the efficient frontier can be written uh, as this uh, hyperbolic equation. And so what we want to do is maximize Z with respect to this particular constraint. And this was a new problem, actually. This is not a problem that has showed up in, in, in the Markowitz mathematics until this point, but we sort of uh, arrived at it with this idea of trying to maximize the probability of reaching one's goals. And then it's just a question of maximizing this with combinations of mu and sigma at our disposal, uh, all those combinations of mu and sigma should come from the efficient frontier. That means maximize Z subject to making sure this condition equation holds because that's the equation of the efficient frontier. Okay, so let's go back to that math. The efficient frontier can be written like this. If you solve Markowitz's problem, then A, B, and C have these components where sigma is the covariance matrix. Uh, and then these H and G are given by these components where um, M is the mean vector of returns and O is just a vector of ones. 
and then L is given by this combination. So the only real inputs in here are the covariance matrix, the mean vector of returns, and a vector of ones. And anybody who's worked with the Markowitz mathematics is very familiar with these objects, and you can write the efficient frontier as this, as this equation. So then the goal is maximize Z subject to this efficient frontier, but we know what that is. And it turns out this was the first time anybody solved this problem and set it up. And when we did that, we found that the solution is actually the solution to a cubic polynomial. And so we took Cardano's formula out of our back pocket, solved it, and we have the entire solution in closed form. And this is what was in that paper that actually won the Markowitz Award. Okay, so we've taken Markowitz's mathematics and we've extended it to this problem, which is behavioral, which is maximize the probability of that investor reaching his goals. And the whole thing was obtained in completely closed form. Okay, so that is a static problem that takes Markowitz's problem and extends it to being uh, a problem that also maximizes the goals of the investor while remaining on the efficient frontier. So intuitively, you should realize now that we've maximized goal probabilities, which is what the investor wants behaviorally, while only choosing something that is also mean variance efficient and lies on the efficient frontier. And that's the static one period problem. What we wanted to do now was do this dynamically over multiple periods. And the first thing we'll do is we'll do it with one goal, and then we'll do it with multiple goals. So that's basically the whole story. So if I'm doing it over multiple periods, and I have a goal sitting at a maturity time t, then I want to maximize the probability that my wealth at that uh, uh, terminal time t, let's say five or 10 years out, is bigger than my goal. And at every point in time, every year, let's say, I'm going to rebalance my portfolio and choose an asset mix, A0, A1, all the way to AT minus one, such that I maximize this particular property. And that's basically the problem. It's a very simple problem. Uh, so we did discrete dynamic programming for it. And we had a value function. The value function at the end on the last date is basically zero if I don't meet the goal, because the probability on the last date of meeting the goal if I'm below it is zero. And it's one if I'm above the wealth level of the goal, and so I get one. And then once I have the value function at the terminal time t, I can work backwards and figure out with the probability transition properties from wealth states to other wealth states, uh, what the value function is at time t minus one and keep going backwards till I get to the end. So the picture for that is very simple. It looks like this. I have all the wealth levels on a grid and I have the transition properties because I know the distribution of wealth from one period to the next. I can also have cash infusions in here. And so this is a normal density function and the probability of being at node I at a wealth level W at time T and then transitioning to node J at time T plus one to another wealth level. So maybe going from W11 to W22, that probability is easy to compute once I know which portfolio I'm holding. So if I hold some portfolio, then I know what the mean and variance of that portfolio is. If I know that, I can work out these probabilities. But the problem gets pretty big because I might be able to hold 15 or 20 different model portfolios here, and each of them has a different mean and variance. And so I literally have to compute this property for all those portfolios, figure out what the expected uh, value function at each node here will be over all these properties and pick the portfolio that does the best. And that's basically the dynamic programming that we have. Okay, so we compute the properties for each portfolio. Each portfolio has a mean. And once I know the mean on the efficient frontier, I know the variance. So really I'm looking across all the different portfolios on the efficient frontier to see which one I need to be at to maximize the probability at the end of meet, meeting my goal. So we basically run that dynamic programming uh, using Bellman's equation. So it's very, very standard. There's nothing new. There's no innovation here. And these are all the equations we need to do that. So basically it's four equations. It's a lot of computer science in here to get this thing to run fast. Uh, if you just in, in, uh, you know, implement it in a, in a standard way, it'll, it, some of these problems will take 10, 15 minutes to get solved because the state space gets large. Uh, but if you do it uh, you know, in an optimized fashion, we, we bring this down to about 10 seconds, at the most about 30 seconds to run the whole thing out. What's also useful is once you solve the problem backwards, you can also go forwards. And when you go forward, you can work out one year out what the distribution of your portfolio a value will be, the wealth will be at any time t plus one, uh, given that uh, you've invested optimally all the way up to, up to that point using this algorithm that we worked out. So, so we can sort of do this and get and generate the distribution of the wealth one year out, two years out, three years out, all the way out under the optimal strategy, which is also very useful for the customer to see. Okay, so the runtime is really quick. 
Uh, multiple goals are easily accommodated. We're going to see that. We can scale this for tax optimization. We've done that as well. Uh, and then we can have policies that kind of, you know, have uh, changed the amount of risk you take if you're underperforming versus overperforming. You'll see that as well. And it's completely efficient. Okay, so it depends only on portfolios on the efficient frontier, which is why it's completely consistent with the previous mean variance optimization approach. So let's take a quick example. We, this is the standard sort of target date fund has these three broad asset classes in the US, uh, bonds, uh, international stocks, US stocks. We took the standard 20 year period for estimating the mean return on the covariance matrix. And you get an efficient frontier that looks like this. Uh, this is not a high risk uh, strategy. The highest risk you can take is about 20%. And the re re mean return sort of goes between five and 9%. So it's, it's sort of a, a small range. Of, of expected returns as well. And this is pretty standard for, for uh, standard investors in the, in the US as well. So it's very, very common. We're gonna have a horizon of 10 years. We're gonna start out with $100 and we want a goal of $200 after 10 years. So you're really looking at uh, wanting a return that is kind of, you know, we, we, if you look at the returns here in these portfolios, they're going from five to 9%, that's a pretty challenging one. And so you kind of have to change the amount of risk you take over time, whether you, depending on whether you're overperforming, underperforming. So we solve this problem using the dynamic algorithm. And then you can produce a nice plot like this, which basically shows you uh, the probability of reaching your goal. So you start out here at $100. And at the end of one year, you can be in any of these states. And if you have done really well, let's say you ended up over here, the probability of reaching your goal is obviously jumped up a lot because your goal is 200. And that's at this point over here. At the end, if you end up here, you're not gonna reach your goal. If you end up here, you're reaching your goal probably one. So there's one here and zero here. That's really what you're seeing in these colors. But the entire space in between, as if, you're, if your portfolio starts doing well and goes up, the probability of reaching your goal gets darker and darker and higher. And of course, if it goes down, it gets lighter and lighter. This is under the optimal strategy. So what is uh, the, the probability at, of reaching a goal at the beginning? There's only a 66% or two thirds chance of actually getting to your goal if you invest $100 at the beginning. But you can also work out the algorithm actually tells you at the end um, also what that probably would be if you started with $150 and that's pretty close to 100%. And if you started with say 125, you would get it all the way up to say 85% probably of reaching your goals. Okay, So you can also tell the investor if you're not happy with this 66%, uh, then you probably need to put a little bit more in there to maybe get it up to say, uh, you know, maybe if you want to get it up to 80%, then you got to put in maybe $20 more to start with and so on. So you get that entire thing at the beginning. It also shows you the entire strategy. So look at what's happening here. We did 15 portfolios, model portfolios, ranging from low risk to high risk on that, that came off that efficient frontier. And if you, if you basically do well, you can see the algorithm starts taking portfolios that are lower. And so the numbers go from zero to 14. Zero is the lowest risk portfolio. 14 is the highest risk portfolio. And uh, the lighter color tells you lower risk is being taken. The darker color obviously tells you higher risk is being taken. And so if you underperform, that is you're not growing fast enough, uh, the algorithm automatically tells you how much extra risk you need to take. And if you overperform, it tells you to dial back the risk because now you want to cruise to getting your goal without taking risk because that might jeopardize a chance of, of getting there on time. Okay, so this shows you that. Now, this is sort of what you get with rebalancing as well. So for example, if you're holding a 70-30 equity bond mix and the markets did badly, that mix automatically becomes say 60-40. And what you'd be doing then is you'd be you know, taking a little bit more risk when you rebalance it back to 70-30. Uh, over here, you actually get the optimal amount of rebalancing that you need to do to get to that goal. And that rebalancing might be 70 to uh, 28 instead of 70, 30 and so on and so forth. Okay, so, so it'll actually tune it so that you take the right amount of risk to get back on track to getting to your goals. Uh, it also allows you to plot the wealth distribution at the end for that same problem. So you can see over here that we've, we've basically gotten uh, the, the wealth distribution after one year after two years and so on. And this is the cumulative, one minus the cumulative probability to get there. And you can see there's a kink at 200 because that's where the goal actually was. And so you get sort of a slightly different slope at 10 years uh, for the cumulative probability of getting to that goal versus, versus later, okay? All right, a uh, couple of things. If I wanna look at 
beating 150, I can get the property. If I want to look at beating 200, which was my goal, I can get it. So if I don't have any infusions along the way into my portfolio, you already know you get that 66% chance of getting to your goal. If I just put $1 in extra per year as an infusion, my property jumps to 73% chance of getting to that 200. That's an incredible increase. And then if I just put $2 in, I get more and so on and so forth. Okay, so it also tells you what the chance of getting to your goal can be if you just decide to save a little bit more. And this is kind of interesting because investors respond very well to this kind of uh, notion that, you know, if I just put in a little bit of money more, I actually really changed my chances of getting to my goal. Uh, likewise, if I take money out early, the probability of reaching my goal drops just as fast. And so that's something also that investors should be told that, look, don't take money out unless you really have to, because you're really damaging your chances of, of getting to your goals by doing that. Now, the classic problem is one that we wanted to do just to compare this with standard target date fund investing. So let's say you've reached 50 years old, you have $100,000 in your retirement portfolio, and you have access to the same three funds, the broad three asset classes. What you want to do is keep putting money into your retirement account till age 65. And then you want to withdraw 15,000 a year, uh, sorry, put 15,000 a year until age 65, inflation adjusted. And then from age 66 to 80, you're going to draw down 50,000 a year at a, at a 3% inflation rate. Okay, so in the beginning, I'm going to put in money which grows at 3% a year. And then I'm going to take 50,000 out, but not 50,000. Uh, it's going to be 50,000 uh, into 1.03 raised to 16 for the first year I take it out, and so on and so forth. Okay, so it grows with inflation, and that's what I want to do. So I want to look at my optimal strategy which we've just looked at, the dynamic programming strategy, which is goal-based, and compare it to what you would get if you took a standard target date fund. So this is a standard target date fund table that a lot of the funds in the US use. Depending on which age range you're in, they will mix those three asset classes in these mixes. And you can see, as you get older, uh, you go more into bonds and less into stocks over time. So we could just compare how somebody would do if they were in this situation with the standard target date fund strategy, compared to what we would have in terms of the probability of, of meeting their goal. And their goal is really to be able to be solvent through this period to get, uh, to get that money. So the chance of staying solvent under our uh, algorithm where we put 15,000 a year into it for the first 15 years and draw 50,000 inflation uh, uh, in increased for the remaining 15 years is about 60%. And if you follow the target date fund strategy, it's only 27%. Uh, if you put 10 a year in, you get 42% versus 11. If you put 25,000 a year in and try to catch up quickly, you get 85% versus 63% uh, with the target date fund. So this definitely beats the target date fund. And the simple reason for it is if the portfolio is underperforming the goal, we will take a little bit more risk to get you back on track. The target date fund, in fact, is just constantly taking risk off as you get older. And so it is completely time dependent and not cognizant of the state of your portfolio. Whereas the GBWM algorithm is both a function of time and state, it's not surprising that it does better than the target date fund. Uh, what is only surprising is how much better it does over the target date fund. In fact, when we first did this, I, would, I thought maybe we'll do 10% better. Uh, we were actually quite surprised how much better it actually does. And I think the intuition is pretty simple. When you have a long horizon, uh, small differences actually matter quite a bit. And this is really nice. Customers do feel that you know, this, is, this is helpful to them. Multiple goals. So suppose you want to actually extend this not for one goal, but you want to have multiple goals. And every year, let's say you have some goal to take some money out for different, uh, different objectives. So I'm going to show you a very simple uh, example where there are only two goals, uh, one at the 10th year and one at the ninth year. Okay, So at the 10th year, we have a goal where you have to draw $80 out of your portfolio. And it has some utility. So we're going to think in terms of some weights that we put on these goals. Don't think of them as pure utilities, but just think of them as a weight uh, or, or some amount of satisfaction that you get from it. Uh, in fact, we automatically find these weights. We have an algorithm to do that. But right now, we just say we have these weights with a utility of 2,000. And then we have a goal at, uh, at year nine where we're going to have to draw out 50, uh, 50 bucks to actually get a utility of 100. Okay. Now I'll just, I'll just walk, walk you through this. So, uh, you know, it's very easy. So these are the two time points. Uh, at this point, we have a goal that costs 80. So if you pay 80 and the only three wealth levels. So let's just think of a grid that has only wealth level 40, 90 and 140. So we've made 
our algorithm operate on a very sparse grid. And if the cost, if the goal costs 80 and I have wealth levels 140 and 90, I can actually take that goal and it gives me a value of 2000. And down here with 40 bucks, I can't meet that goal. Let's say it's, a, it's something that I have to pay 80,000 for like an upgrade uh, on, on my house. And so I basically will get only zero in value. Now I come back one period to nine. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work out, let's say I'm at wealth level 90. I'm gonna work out what's the probability of going from 90 to 140 and 40, these three nodes here. So, so I already worked out using my transition probabilities that my probability, if I use portfolio one, is 70, 10, 20 of going to these three wealth levels from 90. But if I use portfolio two, the probabilities are these. So think of two model portfolios, and I just want to choose between them. So I've got these three probabilities. So I can work out the expected value here on the first portfolio and the second portfolio. Okay, so 1600 for the first one, 1800 for the second. And so obviously I'm going to hold the second portfolio that has different transition probabilities. And my value function here is 1800. And likewise, I can work it out for the node 140 and 40. So I work out those as well. And I get 1950 here, 1800 here, and 1750 here. Now at t equals nine, I have a goal where I have to pay 50 to get it, but it gives me a utility of 100. So let's explore this one by one. If I'm here at 40, I cannot get that goal. So my utility is just going to be 1750 because it's whatever it was at the level of 40. Now at 90, I can take that two choices. I pay 50 and take that goal of 100 and get utility of 100, or I don't. So I have these two choices. I'm going to work them out. So let's see what happens. If I pay 50, uh, let's go back here. Uh, if I pay that 50 at 90, then I have 40 left. That puts me down here at 1750. 1750 plus that 100 utility I got gives me 1850. If I don't take that goal, I'll stay at 1800. So clearly I should take the goal and get 1850. Now over here, I've got 140. If I don't take the goal, I get a utility of 1950. If I take the goal and pay 50, I drop down to 90, where I have 1800. 1800 plus the 100 gives me only 1900, and that's less than the 1950, so I don't take that goal, and I stay at 1950. And this way, I go backwards. Now, we can do this for multiple grids. So you can see the algorithm is pretty simple. You just work it backwards, but you're going to do this for a very fine grid with, with hundreds of goals as well. So it gets complicated. You could have at a single time point, multiple goals, not just one like I did over here. You could have one goal that costs seven has utility of 10, another goal two that has two, two levels. Let's say a car that you want to upgrade. So you can buy a cheap car with the utility of 10 or a more expensive car with the utility of 30. Or you can have another goal like college fees and you can say, I can afford 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 or 40,000. And each of them has different utilities as well. So when you combine all these, you get uh, two into three, because this is take the goal or not, that's two combinations here. Take the goal uh, two ways or not, so it's three combinations here and five here. So I get 30 combinations and you can put them all together. Now some are dominated. For example, a, a cost of 10 gives me a utility of four, but another combination has a cost of 10 gives me a utility of 10, this one gets dominated. So I can reorder by cost and clear dominated cases and then reorder by utility and clear dominated cases. And so the real choices boil down to about 10 odd or 10 or 11 odd choices over here of cost and utility. So all this happens at one particular time point. So I literally have to research taking each and every one of these combinations and look at 15 portfolios. So there's a mass number of decisions to be made at each node on that grid and the grid has thousands of nodes, okay? So there's a fair amount of computer science to get this thing to run fast, uh, but we can always do it even for a 60 year problem under a minute, okay? So here's a simple example. It's a 10 year problem. And I have a goal at five years and another goal at 10 years. Uh, the goal at five years gives, cost me 100. The goal at 10 years cost me 150. And then I can put different utility combinations here. So the investor might put equal weights on both the goals, in which case, the probability of getting the, the short-term goal is higher because obviously it costs less than the long-term goal. And so you're gonna you know, have a higher probability of getting that versus this. But if you put higher weight on the long-term goal versus the short-term goal, then the algorithm will give a higher probability of getting, the maximize the probability of getting to the longer-term goal and, and you know, forego this one and so on. Okay, so it takes these weights into account 
and tries to do that. This is the optimal portfolio strategy actually I showed you. So once again, portfolio zero to portfolio 14, I start out over here and take a, a huge amount of risk. And then if I'm doing if I'm doing well, I actually take more and more risk because I want to get the first goal and I want to get the second goal. If I go very well, then obviously I can take some of the risk off. And then if I go down, I actually start taking less risk because I just want to be sure to make the first goal and forget about the second goal and so on. Okay, so you get these very interesting pictures of the strategies that vary depending on goals, multiple goals over time. We can re cast this entire thing in terms of efficient probability frontiers. So if I have two goals, I can actually look at, and I can basically say, I want different utility weights on these goals. And from those different utility weights, I can trace out the optimal combination. So if you look here, we have different combinations of probabilities for these goals. I'm literally tracing out those probability combinations like this when I maximize. So maybe I had target probabilities for the first goal of 41%, for the second goal of 45%, and that put me here. When I solve the problem, I realized I can actually be on this blue line, which is better than this here. And so maybe I want to be somewhere on these points, and our algorithm will actually take the customer and put him on these points as well. So you can push the person out to these things. If I have three goals, goal one, goal two, and goal three, then instead of a curve, I get a 3D surface, and all the points on the surface and behind it, that is below it, are actually feasible, uh, you know, uh, goal, uh, goal, goal combination, goal probability combinations over here. All the points inside here are feasible. All the points above this curve are not feasible. So if an investor says, hey, I want to be here, where I have 60% chance of reaching goal one and 80% chance of reaching goal two, that clearly is not feasible with the asset classes that are, you know, allowed for the problem. But obviously, if he says something here, then you can tell him, yes, you can actually do better than that. All right, so let's look at a much bigger problem. Let's say it's a 35-year-old couple with a five-year-old child looking for a 60-year plan. So they want to go from 35 to 90 years old. And we've thrown the entire kitchen sink in here. We've got all of Brunel's different things. So the top level here are the essential goals. So you're going to have to make a mortgage payment for the next 25 years. So every year we have a cash flow of $10,000 coming out. Uh, you pay property taxes of 6,000 every year for the next 60 years, uh, long-term care insurance. So we put all these things down and the cost of those goals are here as well. And plus we grow them at some inflation rates. Then you have a second tier goals like orthodontics college uh, and so on. And the remodel, these are sort of nice to have. And these are really sort of dream goals like philanthropy and so on and so forth. Uh, the, we also have infusions. So you start out with 100,000, then you get the, 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 both these people are collecting a salary of 70,000 increasing annually. And then at age 69, when they retire, they'll get that much in salary. And then they start getting social security after that. So all these cash flows are coming in and out as well. So how do we actually solve this problem? We, we threw this into the utility. Uh, we put utilities on all these goals, high utilities on the top ones and it gave you the entire solution. So this is again, those 15 model portfolios. And you can see in these regions, the investor will be taking more risk in these regions, the investor will be taking less risk, but along the way, each of those goals is making payments uh, coming out of their portfolio. So the final grid looks like this. These were the utilities that were assigned. You can see very high utilities on the important goals, lower on the second tier, even lower utilities on third tier and so on. We solved it, you can see the algorithm basically gives you 99% probability of getting to all your top tier goals. One E, one D, uh, all these are sort of everyday and partial. This is, so this is 3%. So the everyday expenses, you're gonna reach a level of 60,000 a year, uh, almost surely. And then you can, with a small, small probability, you might have to sort of agree to a 50,000 a year thing and so on, okay? So you can quickly change these. So for example, if the uh, investor says, you know, this college goal here for the four years of college, the lowest was 76%, the highest was 82%. I actually want to get this up to 90% for all these four years. Then what I would do is I would take this 900 and bump it up say to 1000 or 1200 or something like that, recalculate the whole problem. What it'll do is push, obviously push these properties up to the detriment of some of the other goals. And so there's some trade-off and back and forth uh, the way we would actually solve it is not even ask the customer for utilities. We just ask the customer, give us your target probabilities. And we would actually solve for the utility values here that would come closest to giving those, those target probabilities. All right, so that's, that's how it actually gets done in practice. Uh, 
it's nice also to see a realization of this strategy over time. So if you have a path, uh, this is the wealth path over time. And this is a path that did really well. So the customer started with 100,000, went all the way at the peak up to about two and a half million dollars in, in wealth. And then obviously it was running it down because you retire and then you, you know, cash, uh, cash flow stops coming in. These are all the different uh, you know, uh, goals. All of them occur at different times. So for example, college shows up over here. You can see the orange bars uh, taken care of. Um, and then the everyday expenses are these big green bars that are growing with inflation. Uh, you can see the car goal is here. There's a every five years, there's a car goal that gets taken, the blue, the blue lines over here. And then you have things like the mortgage payments. You can see the little purple color throughout as well going on and, and so on. Okay, so these are under a good this is sorry, this was under a, a good path, and that's under a bad path. Okay. So under the good path, you can see even these goals, the ones down here, like the holiday trips and wedding, these wedding here, holiday trips at the top, they're getting taken under a bad, and this goes all the way up to like 3 million. Okay. And then comes down to here. So the end, uh, after 60 years, they're left with 60 million and the bad path at the end, they're left with only under 500,000, but they still meet a large number of their goals. So you can quickly flip back and forth. And you can see, if you just look at these, you can see which goals are getting shaved off if the realization is bad, but you're still meeting a large number of the goals. And so effectively, uh, this strategy actually meets most of the essential stuff most of the time. And then, you know, the nice to have stuff often depends on the path as well. But you can actually handle lots and lots of goals over a very long horizon in this framework. So I'll quickly summarize and leave some time for questions. Uh, so the GBWM or goal-based wealth management is not optimizing performance versus benchmarks only. It's also about maximizing the probability that investors will reach their goals. It's completely consistent with mean variance optimization because all the portfolios we use are on the efficient frontier. And so by default, we are not straying away from the efficient frontier. What's really happening is every period you're picking something. So you move up and down the efficient frontier dynamically over time while trying to maximize the probability of reaching your goals. It handles mental accounts more optimally in a single account, okay? Because you saw everything was done for, for all these hundreds of goals uh, in, a, in a single account. It also handles partial goals. It's not glide path investing with targeted funds, okay? It's, it's actually a surface of outcomes that are a function of time as well as the wealth level in the portfolio. It's certainly not one size fits all because a customer gives you another set of goals, um, from, you know, from customer to customer, you get different sets of goals and it actually solves the problem for every specific customer's goal set. Uh, it's completely external to dynamic. I just showed you the dynamic portfolio optimization, but we did an experiment saying, what if we didn't do it dynamically? We just every period just statically redid this thing. It, it, it doesn't work too badly as well. So the same framework can be done without the heavy computational effort if you did static optimization, at least for single goals. With multiple goals, we are not that sure that it actually works uh, terribly well. Uh, we didn't uh, just use multiple goals, we also used partial goals. So you could have at any point in time, the ability to take you know, a lesser version of the same goal, like you know, reduced version of the car, uh, cheap car versus expensive car and so on. Um, we have extended it to regime switching efficient frontiers. So if you want to sort of say, can you also overlay good economic regimes versus bad economic regimes? And we did that with two regime models and with three regime models. It turns out there's no real benefit to going to three regimes. Two regimes do the job quite well. And that paper is also on the Social Science Research Network. So you can, you can download it and take a look at that one. Uh, we've also extended to US tax optimization, which is such a complicated tax code, but we've been able to do this with tax optimization as well. Uh, I showed you versions without tax optimization. Uh, that paper is also on SSRN if, if people are interested. Okay, and then we have this little optimizer at the end, which says, we don't need you to tell us utilities, just tell us what your target goal probabilities are. And we'll be able to actually back, work backwards to what the utility set should be to actually give you those target goal, uh, target probabilities as well. Okay, so uh, I'll stop there, Jurgen, and, and see if people have questions. Hopefully that was not too quick and too fast, but gave you a general idea of, of everything, so. Okay. Okay, um, I take uh, already a question, the first question that came in 
um, is the graph on the optimal strategy over time showed how to dynamically switch from one mean variance efficient portfolio to the other in function of where the portfolio quotes relative to the goal. Yes. Do you have evidence on how advisors or clients react to the trading signal of buying low and selling high? Do the trade proposals have a high acceptance rate by the customers themselves? Right. So, 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 so the customers definitely find this useful because they're able to think of it in terms of their goals as well. Uh, and you know, that's that they, they, what happens is they, they get comfortable with the framework, but then other questions come up. That is, uh, can I do derivatives in this framework? For example, you know, is it, is that a way to get to goals better? Um, so, you know, I've done some work on that as well. And it turns out, yes, you can fine tune these with, with, with that. Uh, so what, what it really does is customers find this an easy framework to understand, but then they also have other questions. Other questions are like, what if I combine this with annuities? So in some sense, you're escrowing some of the risk away when you buy an annuity because you now have a fixed stream. How do I combine annuities uh, with, a, with a framework like this? So, so you know, that, that is uh, in, in, in another extension that, that often comes up. Uh, and then, you know, how, how do I sort of change this? So one of the things that will happen is obviously it's not going to remain the same over 60 years. Life, life events happen that change. People get divorced. People get, you know, have kids. Extra kid comes. You want to redo the whole thing, so that that gets changed as well. But by and large, uh, the, the 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 customers tend to find this a framework that tends to be resonate very well. Uh, also, a big a big thing is that if the market takes a crash, you often get this thing where, hey, take my money out. I can't bear the risk anymore, right? So if there's a if there's a fifteen percent drop, so let's say currently you had a goal that had a ninety eight percent probability. The algorithm says there's a ninety eight percent chance you're going to get to this goal and the market crashes. Now it turns out that if the goal is further out, like 10, 15 years out, even though your portfolio is down 10% or 15%, the probability of your, you know, under the strategy, the probability of your goal actually being reached goes from 98% down to 92%. And when the customer looks at that, they generally feel reassured that, hey, it's not such a bad thing. I don't want to pull my money out anymore. So in many ways, this kind of helps the financial advisor work with, 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 uh, with customers. Because that's the last thing you want to do. You, you mentioned the buy low, sell high kind of thing. What customers end up doing in panic is literally you know, selling low and, and then buying back high later. And if they don't panic and don't do that, then you know, it's better. And so, so the gold property framework actually is another way of looking at, at how badly off you are. And it turns out it gives you a much better picture than, than you know, oh, my portfolio dropped 10%. What do I do now kind of thing? You know? Can I can I conclude then from that on a more commercial level uh, that you have or that Franklin Templeton use also the methodology for a particular client segment, or uh, could you apply it to any client segment? You can apply this to any client segment because what I what I presented here is pretty general, mm -hmm. you know. So so now obviously different companies will have different client segments. So. A Schwab might go, you know, much lower down with a much smaller investor portfolios, maybe below one million. Uh, you know, Franklin might have portfolios that are, you know, they're looking at clients that are both small as well as larger clients. Uh, you get uh, what you what you really see is different is the initial wealth is much higher for certain class of clients, and you also see that the goal set is very different for that class of clients. You see a lot of goals around philanthropy and, and those sorts of goals. And then you also see the more sophisticated clients will ask for things like, can we use this with derivatives? Can we, can we mix this with uh, step up annuities, for example? How do, we how do we mix this with a longevity product? So in the US we have uh, 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 forwards on, on, on longevity annuities, they're called QLAC. So for example, you can put at the age 50, you can put $125,000 into this thing, and it'll tell you that when you turn 80, you'll get an annuity stream that'll be $5,000 a month. And so can you mix that in here as well? So it's very easy to mix that in this framework because what you really do is you just take that and you work out the cash flows from that framework. So what would happen is you reduce your portfolio today by 125,000. And then in the algorithm on, on age 80 onwards, you'll be adding an extra 5,000 a month uh, roughly 60,000 a year into the cash flows. 
And then you rerun the algorithm with those cash flows and see whether you're, you're getting to more goals under that framework versus not. You know, so it's very easy to use this uh, with extra add-ons that customers might want. Yeah, so it's almost also uh, already leading to the next question because you, you already hinted to it. Uh, what about a situation where multiple goals are linked to multiple pots? Right. So in fact, here we don't have multiple parts. We literally have one part. And this is very useful because there are a lot of robot companies out there that actually have uh, different parts for different goals. And then there has to be a conversation with the customer. Can we take something out of your goal, your college goal, and move it to your retirement goal? Because you know, your retirement portfolio is kind of underperforming and your college portfolio is overperforming. You know, can we move it out? In the framework I just showed you, it's completely unified. You don't actually have to take money out of one part. It's automatically being done. We're, we're trying to maximize the property of reaching all these goals. And so you can think about it this way. If I take a global problem and I break it into sub-problems, I have a lot of sub-problem optimal, but they don't always add up to the global optimal. And so this reallocation between uh, you know, uh, accounts is very automatic in this framework. And it's not automatic in the, in the other frameworks where you have, it's, it's definitely easier for customers to think of separate mental accounts and separate portfolios for different goals, but it's certainly not optimal to do that. It's better to combine them into one, into one algorithm. And that's what, what this thing does. I also have uh, here somebody who also wanted to congratulate you for this quite intuitive approach, uh, stating that it's a big leap forward in the customer conversation on the whole. So that's somebody who's certainly who's going to go further with, with that uh, discussion here. Um, I don't see any other questions. Are there other questions in the chats? In fact, uh, my co-author, Andy, has been actively answering things in chat. So that's good. Thanks, thanks, Andy. <laughs> Indeed, and uh, we will forward also the replies to, uh, to the people who are attending uh, the, the, the webinar today. Um, no other questions? Uh, well, uh, in that case, I will be able to conclude uh, the session uh, of today, uh, the final session of our first webinar series. I particularly would like to thank you, uh, Professor Das, for sharing with you, us uh, this um, on this very inspiring topic. Um, and I invite you all to follow us on LinkedIn to stay informed about our upcoming events. When leaving, do not forget to give us uh, your feedback. This will help us improve future sessions. And once again, thanks for joining. Have a great week and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you Jürgen, for having me. It's really a pleasure to present my work here. Thank you very much, Ajif. Yeah. yeah.